Yes, we're all muted, I guess. Okay, okay. All right. So welcome to the March, March, gosh, 2018 webinar. Um, today we're going to cover uh, ALS milestones and reminders, open ed week activities, campus spotlight. Um, we've got a, camp, a couple of campuses that are going to talk about their ALS incentive models. Um, we're going to we're going to skip this one, this go around. We'll probably address it next time. Um, we're going to um, talk about 8798 round two funding and questions you might have around that. And we'll give you guys the rest of the webinar schedule through May. And then we'll just do some wrap up and some reminders. So Leslie wasn't able to um, be here today. Um, she is in Humboldt, so hopefully um, nurturing some relationships there and, and um, having a good time. And then um, here is our LA, ALS team, as we always like to introduce in the beginning of the webinar. Um, and then we just like to. Um, Give a big shout out to all those that attended LES Day and the OLC conference last month. Well, oh, gosh, in the end of January now. Um, thank you guys for all for all of your participation, and it's always great to meet face to face and see all of you and hear from you and know what you're struggling with and what you're succeeding at. So it was um, I felt like it was a, a great two days of being together. I hope you guys feel the same. Um, Okay, so I am going to turn it over to Erin. Thanks, Teresa. Welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a great week. It is Thursday, one more day for the weekend, and my hope is that you have amazing plans to look forward to. <coughs> um, so I'm going to cover a few things for our ALS family, but I think some of them might be helpful as well for our AB798 folks. So we're gonna start with a few reminders. Uh, there's a lot going on right now. And so you'll find that each webinar, we might reiterate the same things just to kind of help you keep it all together because it's a lot going on. Um, so let's start with the RFP. I know everyone is uh, working diligently on the ALS RFP. As a reminder, the deadline is March 30th. I sent out invitations to all those on the ALS listservs last week to a series of office hours that I'm leading throughout the month of March. Those are open access. You're probably fairly familiar with how my office hours work at this point, completely optional. They are not required. If you attend one, you don't have to attend all of them, but you can come back if you want. And they are open informal spaces for you to get questions answered about your RFP. If you want me to take a look at your RFP and get feedback, uh, whatever it is you need, to be able to comfortably meet that March 30th deadline. That's what they're for. Um, so we'll look forward to those uh, coming up next month, and I look forward to seeing those of you who feel like you need to attend. Um, but again, do not feel obligated to do so if you feel like you got it and you don't need support. If you'd rather connect one-on-one, -on -one, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and we can set up a time for us to kind of chat, go through where you are with your RT, um, and we can do a one-on-one -on -one kind of brainstorming support session you're also welcome to just simply email me, email me what you have, and then I'll review it and send you feedback. So the point here is that however you need support, however often you need support, that's why I'm here. So don't hesitate to take advantage of that if you feel like uh, you, that would be useful for you. And then one final reminder as it relates to the RFP is that uh, it might be a good idea if you haven't already done so to just give your provost a heads up that you'll need them to sign before you can submit it. Uh, last year, um, in some instances, that would cause a little bit of a delay because folks were kind of working to the ninth hour on it and then they needed to wait like another week or two before their provost got a chance to read it and sign off on it. So it might be good to kind of just, you know, lock that up for them, ask them to expect to receive it from you by X day, and if that might expedite that. So I'll pause there to see if there are any questions about um, RFP related things for ALS before I move on to end of year reporting. Thank you. 
Okay, great. So let's talk a little bit about end of year reporting. We didn't really talk very much about this in January because it felt so far off. Um, and we are now at the end of February, early March, and we really have a little less than two months before this is due, if you can believe it or not. Um, and so again, to keep things from creeping up on us, we just want to make sure this is on your radar. And um, I will send out a calendar home like I always do with the due date that you have it on your calendar and don't forget about it. Um, we'll also do office hours for reporting again this time. I just will wait and schedule those in April until um, you get past the RFP so you don't feel overwhelmed. Um, but the point of this is to just, again, get it on your radar so you have something that you know is kind of coming down the pike and we're minimizing surprises so time can get away from us. A few reminders. One, this should be a continuation of your December report if you submit it a December report. And the idea is if we submit do half of the report in December, we only have one half of the year to go in the April report and we're trying to make the work as minimal as possible and manageable for you. Um, so you should be able to just add any savings and adoptions that were not in your December report for this academic year to that same report and then maybe fill out whatever sections of the homepage part of the report where you're kind of giving more of a qualitative analysis and you should be done. We really want it to be that simple for you. Um, something else that will be coming soon, my goal is to get this out to you guys by mid to late March is an updated faculty uh, reporting survey. So several of you use that survey to acquire the information that you would need to complete your report. Um, and so I'll be updating that and I'll send that out so you can use that to help you start generating that information early. That could be really handy for those of you who have some challenges really getting all the data you need for your report. So we're hoping that as faculty report it, that'll just make that hurdle a little easier for you and you might want to start that early so that you've got that information when you're sitting down to complete your report later in April. Um, and then a last reminder about this is to include cumulative savings for your ongoing adoption. So it's pretty straightforward like how to approach new adoptions um, and savings that you have for this year for first time users. But sometimes there's questions around, well, what do I do with people who are not new? They've been using ALS resources for the last two years or three years or five years. We still wanna see those savings on your report because they're year over year and we do report cumulative. If you have questions about exactly how to do that, that's a great thing to, to work with me on and I can help you kind of figure out the math there. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions or thoughts or reflections as it relates to reporting. Again, not immediate, but we just want this to be on your radar. Okay, great. Uh, and one last reminder in general. First, I want to thank everyone who's already submitted um, events on our spring events tracker. I'm going to put the link to the tracker here in the uh, channel. If you have not already entered your events, or let's maybe say you've had something new pop up that you're planning to do, if you would please just take 30 seconds to add it really quickly. Um, Leslie loves to kind of keep track of those. She travels a lot, and when she's able to, she includes them in her itinerary so you have support from the transfer's office, and it helps her to plan accordingly. So we'd really appreciate that. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Open Education Week. And this is an interesting topic for me because each year we get really excited about Open Education Week, but we often, um, it doesn't get on our radar early enough to really plan early and do something big, and we're working on that. Um, but at least this year we want to have some conversations about it amongst our team. So one, we want to make sure that everyone is aware that next week is Open Education Week. It is a global event. It's a big deal. Um, it's all week, March 5th through 9th, and there is an official website, openeducationweek.org, where you can get a slew of resources from across the world that could be really helpful. Um, and so I want to share a few ideas um, for things that you might consider doing. Um, to take advantage of this global buzz that will be going on to help you drive awareness of your campus specific ALS efforts and efforts to save students money. And I'd also like to hear from you. I think I've already seen one or two Open Education Week events happening on campuses next week. I see Noelia has also um, popped in her information. So I'd love for you guys to kind of share what you're doing, 
Um, and if you haven't thought about uh, doing anything yet, there could be some low lift ways that you could kind of take advantage of the activities happening next week as well. Um, I know you can read what's on the screen, so I won't read it all to you, but just a few things. Again, if this is not on your radar, what can be quick and low lift where you can still take advantage of the time frame? There are webinars that are being coordinated among the Open Education Week community that you could promote amongst your campus. So all you have to do is just invite them to it and make them aware of it as opportunities to be educated about what's happening across the world with OER, cool things other people are doing, what is um, open education, and so forth. Um, they also have a full suite of promotional materials that they've developed that you can kind of take and use um, as you need to um, across your campus. You just download them and print them. Um, you might even have someone, if you've got a graphic design person on your campus, that might want to put your campus ALS logo on there. It's something easy, but the, the resource in general is done and ready to go. Um, there's a shared projects and resources part of the page um, that has really cool, interesting um, stuff that people who are teaching open education courses have provided. And it's um, CC BY, so you can use it, share it with your campus community. You might decide to do small events like lunch and learns for key departments that you're really trying to get invested in either AB 798 or um, ALS. And um, maybe potentially partner with like student organizations and host tabling events or some other sort of small events just to kind of get the conversation going. I'll post the, the link to Shelly, but it's openeducation.week, I think it's openeducationweek.org, but I'll put it in the chat. So I would love to hear from you guys for just a couple minutes. What have you got planned for next week if you've got things going on? Hi, I hope you can hear me. Okay, uh, this is Noelia Franzen from Sonoma State University. And on March 6th, we have a, a lunch and learn event uh, for faculty. And we're gonna have lightning rounds of faculty who have adopted OER materials, um, 10 minute lightning rounds, and also our um, librarian who has been um, pivotal with our OER projects on campus. Um, she's gonna be presenting on, on adopting OERs. And uh, we announced in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, we set an announcement for the chairs. We also sent an, an announcement through our LMS because OER materials can easily be adopted um, into the courses in the, in the LMS and the library also posted um, the event as well. And, and we essentially, we did piggyback on the OER events that at the live as lunch and speakers um, and recognition with that event. Thanks, Noelia. That sounds awesome. And Aline, I see your event as well. Um, Aline at East Bay is doing an ALS and U workshop uh, with different presenters, uh, and they're doing that tomorrow. So uh, Aline, I would love to see pictures and let us know how that goes. I think uh, Suzanne also says that they're doing a uh, campus event. Suzanne, do you want to share a little more about what you guys are doing? Sure. Um, so our, uh, our workshops are both on campus and online. Um, on Friday morning, we have one that is um, kind of how to use open educational pedagogy in your classes. And then on Friday afternoon, we're kicking off a, uh, a four set of four courses, uh, sorry, four workshops on just OER in general. And I'll, I'll post those in the, um, in the calendar, but the, the workshops are about once a month, and if anyone's interested, they're online, and I'll, I'll post information as well. That sounds really great. Now, Deb, you guys at San Francisco, are your events, because you've got a lot going on in the next couple of weeks, it looks like, are those um, related to OER week? Or o Open Education Week, excuse me. Um, not specifically, but yes, yes, and, um, and related to um, some outreach Brian's been doing to chairs and deans um, to start getting some project discussions going for our next round of AB 798 funding. Um, and, you know, just that thing to keep the conversation going on campus. Um, I feel like maybe we're finally starting to see a critical mass. Um, you know, when Brian sent out his last email, he got a really strong response, which was super heartening and encouraging. 
Amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. Okay, I see lots of great responses. Let's, um, Adriana, maybe we can hear from you as the last share out. And what we can do is we can compile all this great stuff and maybe we can include it in the follow-up survey so you guys see these ideas in case that's helpful for those of you who um, have not currently planned to do things, but there might be some low-list ideas here. So Adriana, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? Hi, Krista's here with me as well. Hi, so Krista. we actually, hello. <laughs> We actually tasked our student ambassadors to organize a textbook affordability week instead of, so it is in honor of Open Education Week, but because of our program also, um, we focus on low cost, not just, you know, open. We thought we should change the name to Textbook Affordability Week in hopes to um, kind of really connect with students about like this initiative on our campus. So on Monday and Tuesday of next week, we have coffee and snacks um, in the library and students can share their textbook broke stories. Um, and we've invited like um, the uh, Spartan Daily, so our campus newspaper uh, to the events. Um, on Wednesday, uh, Cengage is actually, Cengage Unlimited actually is having an event on our campus and we offer to advertise that a part of the week. And on Thursday, Cengage is coming back and actually um, hosting a um, hosting a talk with refreshments. Uh, our ambassadors invited one of our ALS champions to present to students about uh, the importance of nano degrees and marketing themselves. So when they graduate college, you know how to promote themselves in the in the work field. And then we also have our student technology trainer who's going to share about um, different resources available to them for them to, to get those certificates and those degrees in addition to their college degrees. And on Friday, um, we are having a student roundtable discussion around textbook affordability. And again, our student ambassadors are in charge of that event. We, um, we don't really plan to go to that specific event because we just want it to be students. They've contacted associated students um, and other, you know, key students on campus and to invite them uh, at that event. And I think that's so far, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> that sounds awesome. If you guys happen to have any plans for any of your work that's going on next week across all the campuses that just shared out, if you want to share those with me, I can upload them to an open ed week folder on our shared drive in case it will help others who might be trying to pull things together quickly. So that sounds really amazing. And I want to see lots of pictures shared on our um, listserv channel so we can see all the amazing, pro the product of all your hard work. Definitely, we'll do that. Okay, I think we can move to the next slide. <coughs> so uh, I will wrap out uh, my ALS part of our conversation today with um, a few, uh, some more sharing out. We know you guys love to hear what other folks are doing. And so I reached out to a handful of campuses and um, asked them to spend just a few minutes each sharing what their campus specific incentive models look like. We get a lot of questions about this and I know there's a lot of, um, there's differences depending on what campus you're at and the stipulations that your campus may have for how you can use funds regardless of where they come from. Um, even though the ALS specific requirements are pretty you know, straightforward um, and not super restrictive, you might have campus specific restrictions that impact that. And so we thought it would be helpful for you to hear from three different kinds of campuses with three different models on how they are navigating some of those challenges to get, deliver incentives to um, their adopters. So we're gonna kick this off with San Marcos team. Hi everybody. Um, Teresa, would you mind clicking on the link that's on this page here? So um, we're pretty generous, I think actually with the faculty, but we try to be really respectful of their time and the amount of time that it can take to find these resources. For some people, it's easy. They find an OER textbook and it's no problem. But for a lot of people, they report back to us that they've spent hours uh, doing this. And I know from helping people that that's often the case. This is our call for proposal page. It's not open right now. It won't be open for another month or so. 
but if you scroll on down the page, you will come to um, a section that lists the, the tiers that we developed kind of over time and modified a bit for our awards. Yeah, keep on going. There you go. Um, so uh, we kind of try to incentivize people in two different ways. Uh, the first one is the percent savings. So if you're looking here, you'll see that tier one projects is a 30 to 50% savings. And so that's for 500 per section. If you look at tier three, which is the highest, it's more than a 90% savings off the previous cost. Um, so that's the one way, and then also it's the number of students that are impacted. So the more sections you have, the um, the greater your award will be, although that diminishes. After two sections, your additional sections are, you get half the amount for, and then there's always a maximum, which is equal to really four sections. If you have a really large course, which um, I think we said is over 60, which for us is a large course, then we can count that as two sections. And so that's it, um, generally. There is a tier four for team um, or department awards that hasn't been used <laughs> very much. I, I can only really think of once, although there is a department who does it in GE courses where there is one coordinator for you know the many many sections and that coordinator determines the textbook we've used it in that case as well um, but it's rare to get more than two people working on a, a course together I think it's really only happened once here in, in what four years so that is it, um, and the page is always open whether we have a call open or not, because faculty like to refer back to it. Um, and uh, any, if there's any questions, let me know. Thanks so much, Susan. Sure. All right. Uh, any questions for Susan before we move on to our next campus to finish our out? Great, appreciate that. Okay, so next up is our team at Channel Island. Hi, can you hear us okay? We can. You have a very cool background, by the way. You look like you're behind like some kind of interesting screen where you could take amazing pictures. <laughs> we are in a booth. We're in the recording booth. Um, that would make sense. <laughs> okay, so um, we thought we'd share kind of some of the things we've been thinking about, which I know you wanted us to share about incentive models, but in kind of looking back to what, what that looked like, it was really interesting because um, we both had thought that we originally last year for our first year put a call out to all the faculty um, as we did this year to be ambassadors but what we realized is we didn't and um, we had never put an original call out we just had really used personal connections and some of the workshop materials that we developed to get faculty incentivized um, and so I didn't have a specific like for the second year I had a specific page that explained exactly what we did and what what each of the ambassadors would get um, for participating whereas in year one we didn't really have that because we didn't do a call out we really did more connections one-on-one -on -one. but um, long story short basically what we did is for the first year for open sea ambassadors faculty that were um, going to redesign a course and uh, reduce the cost by at least 30 percent we offered them a stipend um, of $1,500 and then if they were going to partner on a bigger course so let's say you have a course with 10 sections and there's multiple faculty involved then um, that number changed because it was more of a collaborative effort is what we called it and then we also did want to acknowledge faculty that had already started saving money because this was initiated in the fall so if there were classes in the fall that faculty on their own had already started revising and saving costs from other sections or previous semesters then um, they had gotten a $500 stipend but they had to share that they had to help us create the faculty showcase they had to um, 
participate in a couple of the ambassador events and then create videos um, at the end sharing all that information out because that was our first year um, doing it and so we got a lot of faculty interest I think because of that effort and making those connections and then offering these three different options where it was sharing something you've already been working on sharing something that you're that completely new that you're revising or sharing out about a bigger, more collaborative effort that impacted more students. So that's the first link. It shows a little video um, from our workshop that we shared on our webpage. And the first link um, on Channel Islands itself goes to our OpenCI website that has all of our resources that we've been collecting along the way. Um, and so the faculty showcase is there and some of the materials we've built and put together are there if you wanted to explore it or didn't already um, see that link somewhere else. So then this year we took a very different angle and we started really wanting faculty to have bigger conversations about open educational resources. And um, that was partly because of our path really in, in our thought changing process where the first year we were looking at affordability, affordability, and then we really started having some bigger conversations about what does OER look like in higher education. And so the stipend was significantly reduced where ambassadors um, are given a $500 stipend, but it's more of a combination of let's get involved in doing some digging into OER and what that looks like. We have them do an actual Canvas course. Uh, we call it our boot camp, and we did create a shell, and you can see it linked at the bottom. So that if somebody else wanted to adopt it, if you're in Canvas, we shared it publicly. Um, but it's a five-day workout, so really low, low engagement for faculty as far as their time, where it's 20 or 30 minutes a day for five different days asynchronously. And we have some, um, they engage in like a Padlet, and then we come back together in three different meetings throughout the semester and talk about what that means for their courses. They still have to have a course in mind to be an ambassador that they're going to reduce cost on in some way however we don't restrict it to OER only um, with that but we we ask them to look into OER and find some resources and share those resources so that we hope to open up the conversation a little bit more with faculty that maybe don't know as much about what OER resources are out there um, out of that what we recently had shared at the um, last ALS conference but also um, we recently shared it out on our blog this week is out of that we really ended up realizing that um, and working with two programs directly on more of a program level effort and in looking at that program level effort we were able to discover that two programs that we were working closely with really had the possibility of being a z degree for the major so um, that has been you know something that we announced at the conference but i thought i would share the blog that we just shared out this week and then Jacob with the team of communication faculty created a shell for public speaking, which um, I believe most campuses have some kind of public speaking course, but they did create a Canvas shell for that course so that faculty that might be teaching that course that might change from one semester to another would have basically a plethora of resources to look at and choose from to build their course. So we shared those shells, although I'm not sure they are publicly available on the Canvas Commons. I'm not sure the link, I wasn't sure if the link would work for you directly is the only question um, because they were links that I copied out of my login. So. And if, it, if, they, if the public speaking one doesn't work, if anyone's interested in seeing that it's a CSUCI com c o m m 101 is what we're calling it so then we're going to set up a csu ci com 210 you know 250 and kind of create a pattern to create more shells because uh maybe to add on to that um that that's the idea of before the point of the shells is institutionalize it we have the path to the z degree now but just to make sure that path doesn't go away or that it doesn't fluctuate from semester to semester it's an effort to try to institutionalize and have consistency as new faculty come in move around that we're putting these uh, resources in this public canvas show with a quick start option as you can see that's revolved around the fundamentals of public speaking oer that's got uh, full powerpoints now quizzes and everything it's sort of like a complete course you can use or there's a customizable option with 21 different modules, different topics of public speaking, you can choose their options. Yeah, so we wanted to maintain, you know, 
we really wanted to make sure that faculty still have choice, but that they're, you know, if you have these modules and course essentially already built out, it's a great way for them to just jump in and use the materials already there. And um, as far as sustainability. Ironically, uh, Tamara Rice read our blog post and reached out to us from College of the Kingdom coming to campus next week. We talked with us in person. She didn't know that we had uh, you know, used that as our quick start guide that OER they've been developing. So that's probably a little more information than you were wanting. I think you were just asking about you know our pay structure and how we were incentivizing. But then as we were talking it through, as Jamie mentioned, we realized that we had done it one way the one year, then we kind of changed it. You know, we started out with this little ad hoc and low hanging fruit maybe of gathering people that are already onboarding in-house and now we've changed it and focused more on OER specifically and create a cohort model that's less incentivized with the money but has more of a, a cohort feel to it. And then that's all that the Z degree, which is a different kind of incentivization, but now we're doing more targeted classes in order to remove the barriers where they need to be removed. So it's kind of evolved in that way. That's really awesome. There's a lot of really great stuff going on at Channel Island. Does anyone have questions for Jacob and Jamie? And it looks like there was a question. People completing the OVR course receive a stipend or a badge. Those that did sign up as ambassadors will do a, co a course cost reduction. And they do complete the course, they come to three meetings, and then they, the last meeting they'll share what they did with their course for reduced cost and of course report so that we can report um, for the grant. And um, they get a $500 stipend. And now, a and a digital badge, but the, the, the current course that shared in Canvas doesn't have a digital badge, but our thought is that we were going to make the boot camp available to anybody across campus that might be interested in learning more about OER, and they would at the minimum get a digital badge when, once they complete it. In the Canvas course that we shared out, the digital badge isn't tied to it just because I don't think I can handle um, delivering digital badges to the entire public mm -hmm. if there was that much interest. So. <laughs> Oh, Jacob, but we can't quite hear you. I think summarizes some of it quite well, and the uh, field is an idea of uh, really, I think, evidence based people who want answers and want a textbook i i think we're losing you it seems like there's a lot of background noise but when i mute it's still there so i'm not sure where that's coming from now i can hear you clear <laughs> That's okay. If you want to maybe share your the headlines in the chat to make sure because it sounds like you might be saying something valuable. Oh, yeah, very valuable. Um, I see a question from Susan saying, um, "Do the people completing the OER course receive a stipend?" Or oh wait, no, we already read that one. That's the same one, right? Okay. She was just reiterating. We didn't quite hear what you were saying. You know, things important. <laughs> I don't know if you want to try again or if you want to put it in the chat. Go ahead. Um. Well, what was I saying? I guess I was maybe pointing, can you hear me now? It's a little better. Maybe pointing you, encourage you to check out the uh, boot camp that Jamie created. I think it's a little well done if you're interested all in that. And she made it uh, sort of uh, open, so it's very common. So you can... And then we just pointed those resources really, I guess, to what I was saying. The uh, recent blog post I think summarizes a lot of what we're saying right now and uh, pretty concise fashion. Shell that's also right there. I was reiterating that it's really based on that, I guess I could say evidence based in the sense that we just found that faculty want answers, they want something, uh, some of them want something, and then some of them don't want to just be pushed. They want the option. That's the reason the quick start option emerged from that, as well as the different modules they can choose from. And that really seems to be. Um, Cool. Thanks so much, you two. Appreciate it. And we have one final share out from Linda Woods at San Diego State. So Linda, I will pass it over to you. And just so you know, you guys, um, with Teresa 
And um, I always send out follow-up emails from our uh, webinars, and she usually includes a link to the PowerPoint and so forth. So you'll have all these links and so forth um, afterwards. Okay, Linda, all yours. Okay, so um, we started off with the immediate access program. We were giving $500 stipends to faculty who um, participated in, in that program, and that program uh, inserts digital copies of textbooks so that they're ready from the first day of school, and students can opt out of the program after about two or three weeks. Uh, that program, it took off like a rocket, so we, we stopped paying stipends after number seven, and we are now up to 46 faculty, which would be impossible to pay stipends. However, we will invite them to the recognition lunch um, next September and probably have them stand up because it's a pretty big group. Well, I'm sure, you know, probably half of them will only come, but um, it should be a pretty good group. For OER adoption, we started off with three, and then we picked up another two last semester, and then I have two more that I think are picking up um, over the summer and into fall. So we're currently paying them $1,000, and these are all big courses, uh, but we may re-look at that, and I, I talk about that a little bit uh, further down in this slide. We also had something I call the Merlot Challenge, because I had read that when you do a review, something like 40% of reviewers will then adopt an OER text. Um, so we had 10 faculty take us up on this challenge. We paid them $250 after they posted their discussion in the Merlot um, database. And they had to send me the, um, the link, and uh, then I would take a look at it and make sure it met the criteria of you know, being full sentences, kind of things that, that they would put into their courses and have students respond to. And then we paid an additional $100 if they came to a, a lunch uh, we had and spoke as a group about their experience and what they found and what their next plans were. We had one faculty member out of the 10 um, adopt a uh, OpenStax political science textbook he started last fall. Um, we also ended up with a faculty mentor, uh, Eve Kornfeld. She's in the history department and she's doing a lot of different things. Uh, she uh, adopted OER in one of her courses. She's written some articles about the difficulty of finding good materials. Um, she's doing some workshops um, on campus. She also just received an award, a teaching award from the San Diego State Senate. So at the end of the semester, I'm probably gonna have a sort of a, a page of things that she's done. We just wanted to try something different. It's a little bit not quite as heavy duty um, ALS outreach as actually using it in the classroom and talking about uh, how she used it and what some of the results were with that. Um, so we're going to figure out how to track her down and get some numbers on that. Also in the works, uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the individual stipends, I can see where that's quickly going to get to be sort of expensive and it's, it's kind of hard to keep tracking down one, one at a time people who are interested in adopting OER. So we thought about some of the courses that have a large number of sections like RWS or COM or some of the other general ed courses. So we're, we're, we put a feeler out to our RWS department and they are interested and we're going to be, I, I actually went to everyone's site pretty much on this, <laughs> on this li uh, listserv on our group and looked at what you had on your websites as far as RFPs, um, Humboldt and San Marcos were especially helpful for me to write up a grant. And then I uh, used some of our templates that we have to use for reporting and I'm gonna make that part of the reporting that they have to do in their grant so that the work will be done for me instead of me trying to get it from them. Uh, we're also in the process of joining the Open Textbook Network and part of their training, they'll come out to San Diego State and train faculty, and faculties have to conduct reviews, and we have to pay them $200. So we're hoping that maybe that would be a great time to whichever department actually comes through, uh, we'll focus that training on that department and have them do their searching. That will be the faculty getting that stipend, because as the way I'm looking at this, I don't think the department's gonna give the stipends to faculty. We're not sure yet how they're gonna handle that. But those are some of the things we're looking at right now. And as I listen to some of you talk um, about having RFPs online, 
Um, that was so helpful for me to see what everybody's doing. And I, I feel kind of bad because a lot of our stuff isn't online, but um, that it just, I want to thank everybody who has stuff online that I've been able to use because it's, it's really been a time saver for me. That's about it. Thanks so much, Linda. That's great. Does anyone have any questions for Linda? Okay. Oh, okay. So we've got one question for you, Linda, from Susan. What was the Merlot challenge? So we, um, we had faculty go into Merlot. We showed them, we had a workshop and we showed them a little bit about how to use Merlot. And then we put the challenge out. This was in conjunction with the library that if anyone wanted to, um, to review something in Mer Merlot that they might consider adding to their course, we would pay them $250 after they submitted, um, you have to submit a discussion comment into Merlot, and then they would send me the URL and I would click on it and double check and, and make sure that you know it was legit. Um, and then we paid them an additional $100 for attending a lunch and talking as a panel about what that Merlot experience was like. So it, it's just the merlot.org site. If you haven't seen it before, it seems like it has everything in the world. So it can be kind of a challenge uh, to use that. And um, there's all kinds of things in there, though. There's uh, activities, there's case studies, graphics, videos. So if you haven't seen it before, I encourage you to take a look at it. Yeah, it had some textbooks in there, by the way. So it did have some OpenStax reviews. And I think he had already been kind of interested in switching to OpenStax anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's just kind of, that was the thing that put him over the fence and made him decide to go ahead and do it. I think we've got another question also um, asking, is the college focused to convert courses to OER or to develop an entire program pathway? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Um, it's from, I'm sorry, I think there's an abbreviated name here, S. Rixel. Um, maybe, would you like to ask your question verbally to just make sure we're clear on what you're asking? Um, this is definitely covered from the chancellor's office. I just wanted to know, was the college focused on getting the faculty to convert courses to OER or um, an entire pathway? And was this specifically for San Diego State or for all of the those who shared out? For all those that shared out. Okay, thanks, Tessie. Um, I can speak to our focus, or Jacob and I can speak to it, but um, the, the focus for the university is not to convert all courses to OER but to offer a multitude of pathways for faculty con to consider lower cost um, and other materials, honestly. It could be through the library, it could be um, OER, it could, and most typically it's a combination. The goal is for there ideally to be, when we looked at program level, level efforts, the goal was to reduce, the initial goal was to reduce cost for the program on a bigger spectrum in looking at the program curriculum and the courses that might be um, feasible for, for using other resources. Uh, it ended up developing into the, the Z degree or Z major really, because it's not a full Z degree, but Z major pathway. And, and just to add to that, as I understand the question, yeah, we started by focusing on individual courses and individual faculty and then that developed into the more program-wide approach. And that's what seemed to work for us. We were recently even talking about how if we probably tried to do it the other way. I don't think it would have worked because we were able to gather the people that were already kind of in the same house as we were, people that are already on board, people, the low-hanging fruit, I sometimes say. And I think that served as a foundation um, for then we went back and considered the Z degree. We realized that in those two majors, we actually were like closer than we even thought we were because we'd already you know gathered those that were on board. So we started, more individually and then looked more uh, macro. But it wasn't OER only. We wanted people to have options and know what resources are out there, but also have conversations about 
what what we're doing with OER and higher education. Okay. Um, any last questions for this bunch? Thanks very much. Um, I hope it was helpful to kind of hear three different campus strategies for incentives. And if this kind of content is helpful, we can continue to kind of do this. Because um, I know there's a lot of other great models across the system that might be helpful to learn from. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to stop talking and pass things back over to Teresa. Hi. Okay, so I just wanted to touch base on um, AB 798 round two funding. It is underway. Um, if you need further information about the RFP and any, uh, any information about who can apply and who is um, able to apply and um, the partnership aspect of it, um, I'm going to put in the chat um, the link to the Cool Fred website, which has been updated with the RFP. And as I mentioned, what's new for this second round of funding is that first time applicants are eligible to apply in partnership with round one awardees. And I know there's gonna be some, and we've been receiving them through the email, through our email, some questions about logistically and, re, and, and how that relationship works and what are some of the parameters of that. So I'm starting to think that um, we, we should, hold an office hour similar to what Aaron does for the ALS side and just so that people can come and ask these questions as they're coming up and as you're starting to wrap your head around how you might be able to get involved in the second round of funding. Um, the RFP application will be released soon and we'll do it via InfoReady which is a uh, it's an RFP platform. We used it in the first round um, so we're gonna, we were pleased with the results of that. So we're gonna use it for the second round. And for the first time applicants, um, there'll probably be some questions around that. So always, always feel free to reach out to us via our uh, email address and send any questions. And again, once we try to get those office hours in the calendar, you can bring those questions there as well. And as you go to InfoReady, just be, please be prepared to upload three things. We're asking for your academic Senate resolution, and this is for first-time applicants only, as return, re, return applicants have already submitted theirs. You'll have a campus plan completed, and then we need approval of that campus plan from either your Senate chair or a designee. And it doesn't have to be anything formal as, as um, round one, applicants know it can be a memo it can say it can simply just state we have seen this plan we approve it we're backing it we're in support of it uh, we just want campus buy-in we want all of your stakeholders to know that um, that they are aware this is going on on campus and that, that they're there to support it in in little or or large way um, so the RFPs for the second round are due on June 30th, 2018, and or if you're ready to submit it sooner, we can you can go to InfoReady and upload your stuff, your material and your documents sooner. And um, I had asked about um, office hours, and um, perhaps what I'll do is just send out something via the listserv and ask um, about that and, and when everyone would be available for that, and then. On the right hand side, you'll see that we put together an infographic about um, the data that we collected from your preliminary, preliminary reports at the halfway mark of round one. So this is just the halfway mark and we expect those numbers to increase once we get those final reports for round one and those are also due on June 30th, 2018. And um, if you're having any issues or difficulties meeting any of these deadlines, always, always reach out to us. We're willing to work with you. We're willing to um, help you in any way that we can. So always take advantage of reaching out to us. Um, 
if anyone wants a copy of the infographic, we're happy to share that as well as you're putting together slides and you're talking to different um, campus people. We're happy to do that. And I think that's about it. If anyone has any questions, I can, I'm happy to answer those right now. Hi, Teresa, this is Jenny yeah, from Berkeley City College. And I, I sent my questions to you a few days ago, so I'm just wondering if you heard back with any answers. No, not yet. And um, I've got my, my list of questions that I want to um, sit down with um, Leslie and um, just make sure that we've got, we, we wanna give you the most accurate information that we have. So yes, I do, I have your email actually printed out and um, I'm gonna talk to Leslie when she gets back from her travels. And, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, I see that Stephanie wants a copy of the infographic, so I'll get that over to you, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, and I'll just, what I'll, I'll plan to do is um, take all the chat notes when we're done, and I'll, I'll comb through it and make sure that we follow up with anything that's been put in there that, um, that needs following up. Eileen, did you have a question? Okay, I'm gonna read the chat. So let me just see. Um, how do we access info ready? That is, um, that will be through an URL that we'll send out as soon as we've got everything tightened up in there, it's, it's about 90% ready to launch. So as soon as we've got that tightened up, then a, um, we'll release it via the listserv and it's a URL that you go to. So it's a whole separate um, platform. And then a new spreadsheet to complete, but can we use the old one and add the columns? Uh, I think the only difference between the new and the old were some of the colors changed because we wanted to make it very clear what was needed. Um, but yes, if that makes it easier for you, then, then definitely um, use the old one, Eileen. And then, let's see. Okay, I... Eileen, I will reach out to you and um, I'll help uh, address some of the, the questions that you have more specifically. Okay, if, if that's it, if there's no more questions, then um, I will close out this part of it or, and, and, and just um, mention again that if you have any questions or if something comes up after we get off of this webinar, that um, you'd like to ask, always feel free to reach out. We're pretty accessible. We, um, we try to get um, your answers to you right away, or as, as soon as possible, as soon as we, we are able. So let me share um, the rest of the spring webinar schedule. Um, it seems that Thursday works the best for everyone, so we try to keep it on a Thursday, on Thursdays. Um, we'll do another one at the end of this month. Um, it kind of, it, we were trying to do one in February and the, and the month was so short that it got kind of, it got pushed to this March 1st date, which then we're going to be back online again with you guys on March 29th. Um, and then we'll do another one on April 26th. We'll do one on May 31st and then we'll um, have a summer break June through August. And then, um, here are our social media handles follow us keep in touch with us um, and then just wanted to say thank you thank you again everyone thank you thanks to everyone that shared today it's always very helpful um, I would like um, 
to see, maybe we could reach out to the CCCs and get them on next time and see what their incentive models are. I think that would be great. And we'll see you on March 29th. Thank you guys, thank you so much. Teresa, I think Linda wanted to stay on and chat for a minute about the notes she sent yesterday. Let's see who's left here. 